the first episode of With Sonar for the new year. We've got a great lot of ready to talk. We're going to look at the entire year here for us, uh, going up to today, where we were, where we've come, and where we're going. So stay tuned for all that. And we're going to hit all the modes today. We're going to hit truckload. We're going to hit ocean. We're going to hit air. So stay tuned for all that. Uh, Tony and Tanner, you guys have a good New Year's? Yeah. I mean, no complaints here. Yeah. Same thing. Ate Love a lot of food. to hear it. What's your... Uh, do you guys have a, have a New Year's ritual? No, I don't. That, that's that's terrible. Is that a thing? I don't know. I, so, do for some people, it's a thing. I don't know. Some people watch the ball or whatever. I mean, I, I watch I don't football. Do that. Does that count? But that's no. Nah. Um, the uh, uh, I shot off fireworks for the first time though. Had to shell for my kids. Almost blew my face off. But you know, thankfully, we're all still intact. So, so you need the parental like supervision when you're doing that. No, 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 no. We're we're all good. But uh, we're not here to talk about that today because um, we're here to talk about the freight markets and. We've got a lot to talk about today because 2022 was, we could say, a bit of a dumpster fire for a lot of folks. Not everybody. There are some exceptions. But for a lot of folks, a bit of a rough year, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I would say, so here's what I want to ask you guys. What was, if you had to pick one data set that surprised you for either how low it went or maybe how resilient it was, which one would you pick? Tony, you go first. I'll go that inbound ocean TEU index, IOTI. Yeah. Uh, how it was more of the rate at which it fell to back down to pre-pandemic levels. I mean, it was, we talked about it, what, in June? And now it's like, we saw it really start popping up at the ports in September, but it was that rate of change that it was pretty dramatic. And, and that was, I don't know if it was surprising to see it go down. I think it was the rate at which it went down. Yeah. Tanner, what about you? For me, it's outbound rejections. Um, I saw some markets, we saw 30%, 35% of outbound contract attenders being rejected and, mm-hmm. and possibly hitting the spot market. Who knows what actually percentage of that ended up hitting the spot. We know that it was a lot, but the fact that it went up so high and then it all of a sudden just crashed all the way yep. back down to basically almost five-year lows on a rejection standpoint, um, that that was the biggest impact yeah. I felt like that. I like that. I'm going to take the opposite approach. I think that uh, van contract rates were a lot more resilient than I thought they were going to be throughout the year. They came down some. They are negative year over year. I get that. So for somebody saying they're still up, I get it. They're down. But they were more resilient than I thought they were going to be, slower to come down Mm -hmm. than I think they did. I think they were down about... Um, I think they're down about 10% from their high right now or about 4% year over year. Um, I think they're going to come down more. But all in all, I think they they held up pretty well, all things considered. Yeah, especially when you compare it to spot rates, right? I mean, it's night and day difference. Cool, 35% drop? Yeah, so... Big drop right there. Well, let's go ahead. Let's let's. I want to look at the year here. I want to get your your perspective. Um, let's go ahead and throw up a chart. We're just going to look at rates right now. We're, we're going to work backwards. Rates, I think, are usually the thing that we we end on, but we're going to start off there, and then we're going to work back on maybe how we got here. So, you know, so we've, we've got rates right here. Okay, you've got uh, blue is those those line haul contract rates for van that I was just talking about sitting at around two sixty seven a mile. That's um, exclusive of fuel. Um, and then the spot rates there are in green. Those spot rates are also excluding fuel. Uh, they've seen a bit of that holiday bump there. Um, Tanner, from your perspective, you know, what's the, um, I mean, that, that's a big spread, big jump there on the spot rates. But uh, that, that spot rate bump that we've seen there, you think that's uh, sticking around? I don't think it's going to stick around that long. Um, I think you might see maybe five to 10 cents up in the line hold a little bit. I don't think at the end of the day, I think fuel is going to continue to fall. As Tony said, we've talked about, I think it's going to stay even the all in rate. Mm -hmm. I do think you might get a little bit of a jump in line hauls, but really I think the rest of Q1, I I don't see there being any large impact that's going to have a big impact on changes. Excellent. Based on this here, Tony, where do you think contract rates, that blue line are going to go? I mean, we definitely, it feels like we have uh, about 10% at least to decline. I mean, you're looking, what, we're at what, 267 right now? So, I mean, you're you're talking 240 ish range? Yeah, I mean, seeing that in Q1 wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I mean, and I think what's interesting, though, is when you hear, you look back at commentary, right? All last year, seeing double digit contract rate increases. You heard it, and then it it started moving, hey, we're going to be, up maybe single digits. Well, now you're talking not maybe being up or down single digits. Now you're talking double digit declines. And that, right. that's pretty substantial when you start 
thinking, especially against comps. I mean, obviously, we're record highs earlier this year on the contract rate side, but I mean, you start talking down 10, 20 percent. It's a substantial decline in a very short time for something that obviously doesn't move very quickly one way or the other. But at some point, I mean, if contract rates start to fall too far, people yeah. are going to start to get a little bit aggressive or, you know, carriers are going to say, hey, this is too operationally low. Like, we're going to have to do something, mm -hmm. right? And so I think eventually, I don't know where that floor might be. We're going to certainly find out. Um, but it's going to eventually hit a point yep. where people start to make it go the opposite direction. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, whether that happens with excess or whether, you know, there's just a mutual agreement that happens between a lot of those carriers and shippers because everybody remembers, you know, these, these massive pendulum swings. We always talk about that. And it's like... I, I don't, I don't think we, re we don't want to be there. Like that's not a fun environment to work yeah. in for anybody. You don't want these massive pendulum swings. Um, so, so hopefully that, that does get uh, evened out a little bit. Let's move on to the tenor rejections here. Um, the tenor rejections, and this is where that spot rate, we saw that big bump in spot rates. And I, I think I agree with you, Tanner. Based on this, I don't think they are here to stay. I think a lot of it is that holiday bump. Maybe they hang out for another week or two, but you know that blue line there is those tender rejections. It's already flatlined. In fact, it's already starting to curl down a little bit. Um, reached about five and a half percent. Now we're about five point four percent. Spot rates in yellow still hanging out there. So um, again, those, those tender rejections usually lead those spot rates. Mm -hmm. um, I guess Tony, from your perspective, with tender rejections beginning to peak now as we've, you know, exiting the holiday a bit, how quickly do you think it would take for those elevated holiday spot rates to maybe start following the trend with those tender rejections? Well, I mean, if you go in and look at the daily, right, the NTID, and kind of draw it out, I mean, it dropped 11 cents overnight. It's down 28 cents from its peak just a few days ago. I mean, it's already headed down. I think it's at 270, and this is what, at 283? So, I mean, it's already yeah. headed in that direction. So, it, it's a pretty rapid, uh, as capacity, I mean, it's obviously, as capacity comes back online following the holidays, it takes a little while for, for routing guides and networks to work themselves back into the groove after being disrupted. So, I mean, you're talking a week, 10 days to really get back into that, like, as fluid, as available as capacity could, is going to be, given the fact that we peaked out at five and a half percent on the yeah. rejection rate. But I think I think you're going to see it pretty quickly here uh, in January. I mean, we're going to we'll put I'll put it this way: we're going to be lower when we exit January than where we started, and it's probably going to be by a pretty wide margin. I would think. I heard it here first. Yeah, I think rejection is going to be interesting to watch this year because. From what I'm hearing from brokerage clients is that they're starting to chase volume, right? Yeah. Margins are coming down. They want volumes because they know when the market flips, they eventually want to drive those strategic relationships. Mm -hmm. And in order to get volume, you have to be giving your customer great service. Yep. And so I think rejection rates continue to stay below at least 5%, in my opinion, yeah. uh, until we get a change here. But and if, again, in order to drive volume, you have to be giving excellent service, and yeah. that's exactly what we're watching here in the rejections. Yeah. You're not going to turn down contracted freight, uh, and you're not going to see it on the carrier side either, right? I mean, you mentioned brokers. Well, carriers aren't going to reject it because they get fuel surcharges baked into contract rates, and we've yeah. talked about it. Fuel's so high that if they're in the spot market, it's eating into that operating cost, or it's eating into their revenue, right? And if they're in the contract market and have that fuel surcharge, there's a little bit of a safety net. I mean, it's it's still it not great, but I mean, it's it's better than nothing. Yeah. So I mean, even when you factor in fuel, even though fuel costs have come down, you add the fuel surcharge. You know, looking at the DOE numbers onto the contract race that we saw in the previous charts, we're two sixty seven a mile there. I mean, fuel surcharge puts you, I think, just north of 310 all yeah. in approximately on the contract side. So yeah, you, you, you still have a decent margin there yep. um, if you're moving contract freight. Totally agree. Yeah, and volume volume's a good call out, Tanner. Let's move to the volume chart. Folks, we're moving quick today, all right? Like, you got to you gotta keep up with us today, okay? We got we got things to cover. Um, volume, this is this is my favorite chart. Uh, I love this chart, um, not just because of the pretty colors, although that does help um, because I made it, but um, the, you know, I, this is this is the this is the physical goods economy for the United States, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to know what's happening to physical goods in the United States, you look right here. This is that upstream view in what's being transported. So we've got a lot of history on the chart here, and I think we've got a lot of lot to discuss maybe on where we're going. So you know, you called out right 
Purple's 2019. I think we're going to follow that purple line really closely this year. I think we might flirt. Maybe right now, we're at like 4% above it, approximately. We might stay out there. We might go a little bit higher than that. We might even dip below it. I don't know, but I think we're going to follow 2019 pretty closely, you know, give or take, uh, you know, a percent or two. Those, you know, that blue line at the top, which is, uh, you know, 2021 or that orange line, 2020, I, I don't see us getting close to that in at least a year. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to drive it. I think that's the key is like, right. you look at what drove the, that, the increase in volumes over the past two years, right? I mean, you're talking COVID, right? Shut, mm -hmm. Services shut down, where can you spend your money? Well, only on goods, well, and then you factor in stimulus money, right? So it's, it's two combinations. People had what felt like more money. Well, now they're dealing with inflation. They're starting to feel it in their pocket or in their wallet, right? So they are tightening their belt. I mean, you look at retail sales data. Uh, I mean, November was relatively soft. Especially October was okay. November soft. We'll see what December's number is here in a few weeks. But I mean, all indications are once you get into the first quarter, that's where spending kind of slows down because you're you're ramped up from the holiday. Yeah. Well, there's just nothing to drive any more spending. Uh, on the good side, yeah. right? I mean, you may see spending on services, but how many TVs do you need in your house that if you went and bought them over the past two years? How many refrigerators? How many washer dryers? I mean, these things that have been moving over the past two years yeah. just aren't going to be moving near as much. Yeah, I, I, I keep it to a maximum of seven refrigerators, but... <laughs> The, you know, I, I need to ask both of you guys a question. So we've seen inflation. I think inflation's hit food quite a bit too, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, those are things we still have to buy. It, it seems that food really hasn't quite hit a ceiling yet. What is, ha, are there any food items that have, you know, inflated so much that you guys don't buy them anymore? I can't think of one, but I mean, for me, I, it's just me. I don't, I don't That's have, true. like, I got it doesn't one. affect my purchasing habits really. I mean, maybe it, they, maybe I buy, instead of a pound and a half of chicken, I buy a pound, one and a quarter pound, right? I mean, it's just like little things like that, but it's not really, it, it hasn't really hit it. What like Tony noticed. is trying to say is he's recession proof. No. Okay, we got it. What about you, Tanner? Oh, I, I actually saw your tweet, so I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> So I'm going to steal your thunder here, and I'm going to say eggs. <laughs> eggs have gone completely crazy. They have. Luke is so starstruck about how the price of eggs have moved up this year. He's just beside himself. Yeah. I went on a Twitter, not a Twitter rant, but like, I don't know. It was a little complaint. It was a little... There's a little frustration in there, okay? I'm just, I'm just a guy, okay? Like, I'm just trying to, like, you know, have, have a nice meal once in a while. And like, when eggs are like ten billion dollars, you know, per, <laughs> per gram, okay? They're actually, saying that they're now more. Just since I said that, they're now more. It's just, it, it's frustrating, okay? Like, I like eggs. I can't, I can't relate to that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not is, a you know, egg, we're, so. The, the Flaska household is now an oatmeal household. So <laughs> I don't know what you want to do. Like, eggs is basically like buying, like, you know, you know, a five. Wagyu. So <laughs> I, I agree with you from food standpoint, though. I think food is the only segment that has been keeping the CPI report from going either flat or negative. Yeah. Um, every other segment, used cars, gasoline, fuel, all that stuff is starting to start to trend down. Yeah. And even some of them are few negative. Food has continued to be three, four, yeah. five percent every single month. And and the problem with that, well, there's and I well, I have two issues. Only two. It's not that it's an issue with it. It's food is. A necessity, right? Yeah. And the problem is we highlight it. We talk. Everybody talks about core inflation, right? Because they're like, that's what matters. Well, you're leaving out two of the most vital things that we need, energy and food. And those are the prices that have moved the most mm -hmm. over the past two years. So, like, why? Uh, that, that's a whole different... Yeah. I can go down a whole different rabbit hole on that one. Thankful so. to see energy coming down. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that excites me. That's a, a good bit. thing. That gets me excited. Also... Do you guys remember when lumber prices were to the moon? Mm -hmm. They've come down quite a bit. Yeah, and I think that's going to be a positive sign. Yeah, in the, housing. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's going to free up some building. Like, it's going to make building a house more affordable, things yeah. like that. Because, I mean, you're talking about lumber prices cut, what, by 50%? Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking... It just gets more affordable, which, I mean, it'll yeah. play into flatbed capacity at some point. I was about to say, so does the, flatbed, does the flatbed market act differently than the drive-in refrigerator market the first half of this year? I, th I think it might. I don't know if it's quite in the first half, but I, I would 
My prediction would be that the flatbed market sees relief before Van and Reefer does, especially Van, um, just due to that. Once I think that starts to kick in, those building permits kick in and stuff, I think we start to see a little bit more relief on the flatbed side. I, th I think flatbed is bottomed, at least in the near term, due to that. Maybe a little bit of shakiness in the Q1, but I think once Q2 rolls around, but there's lumber prices down, I think that helps a lot. Yep. So we'll see. But anyways, uh, volume's down. I think we're gonna see volumes follow that 2019 trend. Um, we got it. We're gonna we're gonna switch gears here, okay? Like I told you, this is gonna be a multimodal conversation. All right, it's not just about truckload. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna show ocean before we throw it up. This is not a chart. I've never shown this chart on West Sonar before. Um, it's a similar chart to some other things, though. We're gonna be looking at rates. We've we've looked at. Uh, the IOTI, I know Tony said that's one of your one of your favorite ones. I love that one too. We, we've seen bookings just you know absolutely take a nosedive. Um, I think even even worse than probably a lot of the, the truckload demand has. Um, and as a result, we've seen spot rates collapse. Now we have focused a lot of our conversations around the rates. I think on specific trade lanes like mm -hmm. uh, China to North America West or China to North America East, and those have all come down to pre-pandemic levels. But it's important to look globally, you know, just to be beyond, beyond our own backyard. So let's go ahead and throw this chart up. This is the daily spot rate for the global um, global containers. So these are these are for for forty foot forty foot equivalents. Um, so that is the daily spot right there, sitting at just around twenty two hundred dollars uh, for a container. We are nearly nearly at pre pandemic levels. Uh, for this, I mean, really within within ten percent of pre-pandemic levels, um, very close to those twenty uh, eighteen numbers, very close. You've basically given it all up, and there's only a couple of key trade lanes that are holding it up at yeah. this point, and they're not related to North America. Yeah, I mean, you're talking Mediterranean, so yeah. Europe over into China, things yes. like that. That's what's holding it up, and, and I mean, you saw Europe to North America hold up longer than what you saw China to North America yes. hold up, but it's come down, I mean, yes. substantially. So, I mean, it's, this is where, looking at this is great, but you can kind of go down and be like, all right, where, what underlying in this index in itself, right, on the globe is holding it down and what's being a drag on it. So, I mean, I think if you were to throw, what is it, North America West, China to North America West Coast, I mean, you're talking below 2019 levels right. now. So, I mean, it, it's just, they've come down so far. Were they sustainable up at $10,000 a container? No. I mean, that wasn't, that's a pipe dream. I mean, yeah. it, it's just not possible. But I think it's, you look at how fast, I mean, they went down faster than they went up. Right. I think that's the, the crazy part to me is this downward movement has been more extreme than the move upward. And I think you can watch after this by even overlaying TEU capacity, right? Mm -hmm. We've got mm -hmm. capacity and utilization, and that was kind of a leading indicator. You start yep. to see that more and more containers are slowly becoming available. Yep. It's simple supply and demand. That's mm -hmm. what's driven down that price in the end. Yep. It, it, and that's why freight is the best, because, I mean, it is economics 101, which is supply and demand set pricing, right? And yeah. there's so many players across the board that, like you don't really have one major player that's setting the price, right? It it works itself out to to kind of you, you rarely get into that equilibrium state that everything in econ's based off of, but you can see the movements in both supply and demand, and it tells you what price is going to do. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's really exciting too. Like what we're going to see is you know I, I think we, we've seen the majority of the drops happen in mm -hmm. 2022. I think especially on the spot side. We've seen the early stages of it on the contract side. And I think what we're gonna see for the first half of 2023 is we're gonna see similar drops on the contract side. I think contracts gonna catch up to spot. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll close the gap entirely, but it might get close. And then, uh, unfortunately, we're probably gonna see some folks have to exit the market in the back half of 2023. Or, and, or not necessarily or, but there might be a combination of, I think we're gonna see a lot of mergers and acquisitions in Q2 and Q3. Yeah, I think the M&A uh, market during this year is going to be hot. I mean, yeah. you're gonna have, I think it was even Knight Swift in their recent earnings calls kind of talked about like they're gonna be in the market looking for not just buying up smaller carriers, but ones that fit into their overall network and things like that. So, right. I mean, there's, they're going to be strategic on what they do, but they're going to be active. And why are they active? Because 
it's an easy way to grow their fleet without having to go necessarily. They probably can get a discount on buying the business as opposed to just going buying the equipment outright. Yeah. Well, they're certainly not going to be buying eggs, that's for sure. <laughs> Listen, if you want to buy trucks, you can't buy eggs. I mean, that's basically the moral of the story here. You know, we can probably wrap up with Sonar just on that. But we can't because there's a little bit more we got to talk about. Folks, I told you we were going to talk about air, and we are going to talk about air. In fact, we're going to talk about it right now. So um, this chart, one-year chart, we don't talk a lot about air. So um, all the, even though we do have quite a bit of air data, and we're adding a lot more air data each and every quarter. But... Um, you know, really a lot of our air data focuses around pricing and also, and also um, uh, capacity. But this particular air data set, um, don't have any, we're not, we're not looking at a lane today. We figure we start off with a global data set. So very similar to the, um, the ocean data set, this is a global data set. That price is going to be price per kilo. So for those that aren't familiar with the air side of things, this is price per kilo is how that's priced. So we're looking at just a hair and a $3.25 per kilo on average. For those that work in the air industry, you, you know there's massive swings, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, what rate brackets are you shipping in? You know, are you going from, you know, Chicago O'Hare to uh, Amsterdam or are you going somewhere else, right? I mean, all that stuff is very dependent. Mm -hmm. But this is about a global average that we can use. It's uh, uh, going to be updated each week, uh, so slightly slower cadence. But, I mean, you're looking at right there, 25% decline year over year. Yep. So that's what happened in 2022. Uh, Similar almost to the contract rates on the truckload side, the first quarter you see there, or first quarter and a half, those rates are actually on the rise mm -hmm. on the air side. They did not just immediately go into a nose dot. There, I mean, you hit that peak, I think that's right there mid-April. Mm -hmm. Very similar to contract rates. Um, and I think some of that could have been due partially to, that's right when Ukraine happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that took some capacity off the market here. But I guess from an air perspective, Tanner and Tony, you know, what are those, what are those commodities that are, tend to be more biased towards air? Well, they're gonna be the last minute shipments, yeah. right? Um, so things that are in a rush, if it's too long to go via ocean, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you need something urgently, uh, it tends to be over air. So, I mean, I don't know if there's really any like certain commodities. Obviously, there's going to be a couple of things that are emergency wise, but really if, if a customer calls and you need something within the next 10 days, like if your only option is to pay for air, you're going to yeah. pay for air regardless of what your product is. Yeah. And then the other side, right? High value goods, right? Because yeah. I mean, you think about, think about airports and things like that. I mean, they're what some of the most secure places on earth. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not easy. So, I mean, like things like iPhones and computers it's it's easier they're not that heavy right so it, it doesn't cost i mean you're talking price per kilogram right so not they don't take up a lot of space either so i mean it, it's combination of things like that so your phones computers high those high value goods will be what a it right. moves via the air so yeah. i mean it's eggs a, yeah but nowadays yes yeah, but, no, <laughs> no, can, but, yeah. that's why it's so expensive because they're getting airshipped you yeah. know an so the point, chickens can't fly them it's gotta be the birds another important thing I, I think that might have an impact on the air rates is actually is that a lot of people are starting to enter this market in this whole book it now air freight I think we wrote an article on it a few weeks ago um, I had shared it but I, I think there are new players in this space that are yeah. kind of being tech forward and the air kind of tends to you know I know we say trucking lags you know the industry as a whole um, but I think air even lags trucking even more. Uh, so book it now has kind of been a concept that we've had for a minute, but mm -hmm. air seems to be kind of grasping onto that. So that might actually be what's helping the prices yeah. as well. Could yeah. be. The other thing, I, I've started to notice this too, and I know this is a bit anecdotal in terms of edit, evidence, but I've noticed when I start ordering things off of Amazon, it, there's even when I buy the Amazon things, it's not, even when Prime, Prime is like no longer a guaranteed two-day yeah. shipment, yeah. shipping. And it's not like I'm buying an obscure thing and like we know the supply chains have eased a lot. Like it might just be buying like a bag or a backpack or something. And it's a lot of four day is when things are arriving now. And I wonder if it's, you know, at some point, I guess, and let me ask you guys this question. If you, and I know we only have a minute left, but if you had to choose between going from like one to two day shipping to like three to five day shipping, but it's cheaper to do that, would you be willing to make that trade? Get your items a few days later but save maybe whatever the number is, five, 10%. It, uh, for me, it kind of depends on what it is and how bad I want it. Yeah. I mean, if I can wait a couple of days, it's not a big, like in a couple more days. It's, it's if you start pushing out to a week to 10 days versus two days, then it 
it's a little different story. Depending yeah. again, it depends on what it is. I think it's it's I think the better question is, is it going to change the super consumer behavior and do you cancel your Amazon Prime subscription because yep. you're not getting things in two days anymore? Yep. It's a good question. We'll have to find out. Let us know what you guys think. Or in the comments below, if you're on LinkedIn, um, would you cancel your Prime membership or would you pay, be willing to sacrifice a couple of days' urgency in order to save a few bucks on something? Let us know. Maybe things will change. But anyways, thank you for tuning in for Wist Owner. We will see you next week live, 3 p.m. now. It's the new time. So we will see you then. Have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday and enjoy your kickoff to 2023. Take care.